everyone, and welcome to A Balanced Life with Dr. Jackie here at Black Star Network. Let me just tell you, being out today often gives us challenges trying to figure out how we spend our time, with whom we spend our time, and whether or not we're releasing people from our lives. I know many of you already wrote it down on your vision boards. Many of you have put it in places on social media, and you're thinking about how do you release people from your life simply because you haven't developed balanced and healthy relationships. Well, today we're going to talk about it for a moment. We really need to identify, understand, discover what are some of the best ways for us to be able to create relationships through communication, through hanging out, through talking on social media. And today we are joined by some amazing individuals who are going to talk to us about what it means and how to develop relationships that are not only substantive, but meaningful. We're going to be joined today by our mom strategist, I'm going to say that over. We're going to be joined today by our mom strategist, Charlotte Avery, Dr. Terry Witt Bailey of the Center for Leadership Development, our licensed professional counselor today, Aaliyah Watson. And of course, we're invited into our studio today, Stacy Owens, who will talk to us about what it means to have safe spaces for our employees. Welcome in, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I am so excited that each of you are here today because your voices in this space really do matter to how we begin to develop relationships. And, you know, today we're going to do a couple of things differently. I know our audience has been accustomed to all of our group being together, but I'm going to do some one on ones today. I think that as our audience gets to know each of you and most of you will be with us throughout the course of the year, it's important that they understand how we develop this lifestyle of communication and building relationships. And I'm going to start with Stacy for just a moment, because Stacy, in the work that you do as an administrator, as a school CEO, how are you helping your employees navigate the space that they are in and do it in a healthy manner? You know, um, when I first opened the school, I thought I was creating a space where I only was going to have to work with students and making sure that our students was emotionally balanced and increasing their uh, emotional intelligence. And through the journey, I started finding out some of my staff needed the same kind of assistance. So I, I like to start that process by increasing uh, my teachers' social um and emotional well-being for themselves and increasing their emotional intelligence. And it starts by first having an understanding of self. Before you can communicate and work with anybody else and talk with anybody else, you gotta know who you are and what you bring to the table. So we do a lot of self-awareness. Um, do you understand your triggers? Do you understand your emotions? Do you understand the the reactions that that you will have to certain situations because the more you know and have self-awareness the more you can be able to self-regulate and that's the key and then we can start talking about how we reach out to others now that's an interesting concept that you're speaking about because oftentimes people don't know who they are dr whit bailey in the work that you do in the center for leadership development how important is it for you to understand not just your personality type, but your own quirks and idiosyncrasies and how they play out in the workplace? Well, you know, I wish I could say that that answer is easier said than done. Um, it is important when you are looking, especially at other individuals and finding the flaws in others that you look inward and find out why it is that you feel that there are issues or problems or quirks as, as, as you shared. Um, in the work that we do, we connect and, and help young adults, young African-American youth succeed through what we call our principles for success. And they are character development, educational excellence, leadership effectiveness, community service, and career achievement. And what we are finding is that just as your previous guest shared, we need to look at ourselves so that we can make sure that those quirks that, that might be coming out internally um, aren't spilling over into our clientele. So we have to look inward. That's 100% correct. How are we doing? How are we connecting with others? Why are we feeling the way that we're feeling? Um, maybe we should be doing some some testing or some looking at other um, programs or, or tests or surveys so that we can figure out why we respond the way that we do, why we react the way that we do, and why we move forward the way that we do. 
Now, each of those principles that you've just given, Dr. Terry, really do help us somewhat figure out not everything that we do is going to be taught in school. Not everything is going to happen in the workplace. Charlotte Avery, as a mom strategist, and in your book, The 40-Day Tone of Voice, Tone Down, and working with your own children and others, there are often times that our kids are to learn in the home how to go out into the world. What does that look like for you? Um, so, you know, for me, I'm very conscientious of the fact that, you know, I am my children's first example, my husband and I both. And they learn communication and body language and attitude and all of that from us first. And so for me, you know, I really try to mirror um, the way that I want them to communicate with me by how I communicate with them. Now, I mean, honestly, I wasn't a professional at this because I really epically failed um, at it in the beginning, which is why I wrote the 40 day tone of voice tone down and just talk about my journey as far as being a recovering yeller and the damage that I had already done, you know, within my home, within my marriage, within my children, um, as far as my tone of voice. But I had to recognize, you know, like some of you know, our guests have already said, I had to look at myself inwardly to ask myself, why was I communicating the way that I was communicating? Why was I feeling, you know, the things that I was feeling? What were my triggers that were driving me to raise my voice, to use, you know, inappropriate body language? You know, what was the reward? Because a lot of times when we communicate badly and we act badly and all the different things, it's usually because there's a reward that we're getting, even though we're making everybody else miserable. As a mom, it's now you're finally doing what I told you to do because I yelled. The reality of it is, and one of the lessons that I you know, continue to teach my children is that yelling is for emergencies. If, you know, if you're not dead or somebody else is not dead, dying, the house is not burning down, or there's not something catastrophic going on, then there's really no need for you to yell and use inappropriate body language and all kinds of other things. And so I had to look, you know, looking inwardly as a parent, but also, you know, knowing, you know, what behaviors do I want to see my children um, display within our home, outside of our home and, you know, just all the things. And so, you know, as everybody else has said, you know, it really does start within, you know, where you are inwardly. Do you feel inadequate? You know, what is, is it you're trying to control a situation or a person? You know, what are you trying to get out of it? And so those are questions that I ask myself daily. And when I see even my own children or other children that I'm working with, you know, when I'm doing like home rescues and things like that, I always try to find out what is going on internally and to see how we can get to the positive um, to get the positive reaction that we want. I'd like to bring in Aaliyah, our licensed professional counselor, because we do need to talk about those things and how generationally we are helping others begin to have healthy relationships and build communication strategies that are successful in each of their lives. Hi, Aaliyah. Hi, how are you? Thank you for having I, me. I am doing well. I'm glad that you're here. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself and then share with us um, your thoughts and insights related to communication and building healthy relationships. Uh, like I said, my name is Aaliyah Watson. I am a licensed professional counseling supervisor in Texas and Louisiana. I specialize in working, working with minority women with issues such as anxiety, depression, work to life balance, family stress, relationship stress, things like that. So great things like along the lines of what we are discussing today. Um, what I would say is important is, again, assertive communication for us to be able to develop those friendships, those relationships, or even those intimate relationships. It's going to be having being able to communicate your needs and also being able to communicate with your partner, friend or family member whenever you're unclear on something. And also just having a general level of mutual respect for that person, because I think that that also makes a good environment for assertive communication if there is that understanding of mutual respect. Absolutely. Along with Aaliyah, I do want to bring in Stacey Owens to talk about that for a moment because these generations are now crossing over into the workplace. And there are times when 
you know, we were born in a generation where children were to be seen and not heard, and you didn't step into grown folks' business, and you didn't talk when you weren't supposed to. So, Stacey, Analia, how is this playing out in the workplace as you're developing healthy spaces for people to have an environment to work? We also bring some of our childhood self into that space. How are you navigating those nuances? And talk to us a little bit about those things that you share in your book. You want to take that first or you want me to go? I was about to say, you can, I can go first if you want. I think for me, it kind of goes back to what I said, a mutual level of respect. And I know because I'm speaking from personal experience, when I was working in the psychiatric hospital, I was in my early 20s. So a lot of people weren't open to my feedback or insight, but it's like, you should respect that I am capable of doing these things because I have the same level of education and I went through the same process as you. So I think it's going to be a mutual level of respect and being able to communicate like, well, hey, I see that you you're bringing this idea. However, we've always done things like we've always done things like this way. But however, we're open to your insight or why do you feel as if that we should start changing things and doing it that way? So I think it's going to be, again, having those open dynamics to communicate. Yeah, I, I agree. Um, I think it's interesting for in my environment because I have to manage between students and adults. And so you have this generation of youth who can just freely speak their minds. They're used to just coming in and saying, this is what I want. And they want people to create space for them to do so. And then you mix that with a generation of teachers who, if it's not a young teacher, my older teachers who's like, I, hey, I just want you to do what I told you to do when I told you to do it. And we're not going to have this long conversation about it. And now everybody's feelings are involved because now the student is emotionally upset because they feel like they're not being heard, not being seen, not being listened to. And then the teacher, her emotions are off skilter because she feels like you're disrespecting. So it needs to be open and honest communication. And we have to stand back and give a little bit of empathy as adults and put ourselves in the place of whoever we're communicating with so we can start to see it from a different lens. I think that's the hardest and toughest thing to manage today. Now, if I was to just go straight adults, I'm always telling the adults in the building, you know, when you say you want open and honest communication, most people don't have a problem coming to you and being open, but are you always being honest? Honest, not in terms of telling truth, but honest in making sure that, well, in telling terms, you want to tell the truth, but I'm saying it from a perspective of, are you truly sharing what's in your heart to share for what's going on with you? Or are you just leaving space where you want somebody to figure it out or assume? So we often say, I have an open door policy. And then when I ask you, are you OK? You'll say yes. So I have to always follow up. Now tell me what you really feel, because if you're not going to really say what you're dealing with, then how can the other person that you're communicating with really authentically bring a solution or anything to the table. So I, I find we have to define even when we say be open and honest, be empathetic. Be, what does that look like and sound like for your environment? Absolutely. When we come back after the break, let's talk about that for a moment. What does it really mean not only to be open and honest, but how do you bring your personality and your authentic self to the table? We'll be back after the break. Black Star Network is here. Oh, no punch! It's a real um, revolutionary right now. Uh, thank you for being the voice of Black America. All momentum we have now, we have to keep this going. The video looks phenomenal. See, this difference between Black Star Network and Black-owned media and something like CNN. You can't be Black-owned media and be scared. It's time to be smart. Bring your eyeballs home. You dig? Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, learning how to navigate the nuances of going back into the workplace after this pandemic, dealing with our family members, building healthy, strong relationships is always not easy. I want to have this conversation with Dr. Whit Bailey for just a moment, because as we talk about leadership, 
we are a leader of one first. You have to discover what it means to guide yourself, lead yourself, and also know what are your traits? What are your personality? What is your characteristics? Dr. Whit Bailey, in your development of people, how are you engaging and helping them find that balance between who they were told they should be and who they're in the process of becoming? Because oftentimes there's a clashing there within the soul of that person. Actually, I, I 100% agree with that, especially when you're coming into the workforce. And so we'll talk about people coming into the workforce. Um, where I work, there are several generations of individuals. I'd like to say that I'm a young person, but I'm just young at heart now. And, and we have people that, uh, that are working in our environment that are, I, I could be their grandmother. And, and so my idea of professionalism might be different than their idea of professionalism, how you dress when you come to work, um, what you might say, how you show up to a meeting. And so one of the things that we like to do is to look at our personality traits. Now, there are lots of different ways to look at personality traits. Um, I also like to do a shorter version um, with the staff, which is love languages. And, and some people are, are familiar with those love, love languages. I think it's acts of service, um, physical touch, um, I wrote them down. Let's see, words of affirmation, gifts, and quality time. Those are simple to look at. Um, when we look at Myers-Briggs and those personality um, assessments, it's a little more detailed and more specific to the individual. So once we're able to figure out, or the individual is able to figure out, for the most part, what type of personality they have, then they know, again, how they respond, why they respond to certain things. They know who they will be more apt to complement and work with. They'll know if they are the supervisor, um, why they aren't able to communicate in the best light with maybe some of their, their staff members or vice versa. And so I know that was very helpful for me when I first did Myers-Briggs. You know, I just got the four letters and, and memorized the four letters, but didn't really quite understand how that um, helped me to develop as a person, how that helped me to be able to come to meetings and to interact with my staff and to know myself well enough to know how I could interact with others. And then it helps those others. So there are a lot of personality tests that are out there. I'm not trying to, to sell one over another, but again, it's helping you to understand yourself first. And then that way you can interact better with others. Because at the end of the day, you want to be productive in the workforce. You want to be productive in the classroom. You also want to be productive at home as you interact you know, with your loved ones at home. So it's not just about being in the business world. It's about how you interact with your loved ones at home also. I can absolutely agree with that because you have your personal self and your professional self and each of those things you find you out into the world. Charlotte Avery, let's talk about that for a moment. As Dr. Whit Bailey mentioned, the love languages, I know that a part of the work that you do in rescuing families and in having your own little people in the house, they're now of all these different ages, Charlotte. So at what age do you find or have you found it beneficial to help your children identify their personalities and how they present themselves at school, in athletics, and then now as they're starting to work in those spaces? So that's such a really great question because I, you know, I believe that, you know, you have to start out how you're going to hold out. And so for me, I have always taken the, you know, the attitude that, you know, I have to instill certain behaviors and things in them um, and character traits in them when I'm seeing their character traits, because, you know, we all have character traits. You know, some of us have very strong personalities. I know that I do, which helps me to have very good leadership skills. And so even when I'm dealing with my children who are very highly spirited <laughs> and, you know, things of that nature, I always say, okay, these are really great leadership skills. How can we, you know, guide that particular strong will, you know, when it comes to being a good leader in our home? And honestly, you know, I, I it's something that I pray a lot about and there are things that I develop in them and I see them from a very young age because, you know, I heard a statistic that said that who your child is at four is who they're going to end up being at 14, at 24 or whatever. And so I believe that as parents, 
we can't just start instilling integrity and values in them when they get older. We've got to start them when they're young. We've got to teach, you know, teach them, you know, the importance of respect and, you know, saying yes, ma'am and no, ma'am. Mind you, that might be generational, but I come from that generation. And so, you know, even, you know, being what some people might consider an old school parent, I just believe that you've got to, you know, look at your kids for who they are, even pretty much coming out of the womb. And you've got to start doing that right then and there, because if not, you're going to miss a window of opportunity. And now the things that you should have done and lessons that you should have taught your children when they were little people, now you're trying to, you know, instill those things in them when they're teenagers. And by then, you know, they're like doing their own thing. They're either listening to you or not listening to you. And like, you know, like, um, I think like Stacy was saying, you know, and talking about respect, you know, I believe that, you know, I'm, I'm not too old to learn anything from my children. That is one of the biggest lessons that I learned in writing the 40 day tone of voice tone down is that, you know, even as an older people, we all need to be teachable. And, um, and just like our family um, psychologist friend who's with us, you know, we really need to be able to respect people where they are knowing that we can learn. We can learn from a two-year-old. We can learn from a, a four-year-old, a 14-year-old, a 20-year-old or whatever. And it doesn't make us, you know, any um, any less unimportant, but it does make us help. It does help us to be teachable and it helps us to learn their world. And so I just really think that it's important to start when they're very, very, very young. Mm. You you bring up a good question as it relates to beliefs and values. And I want to ask Aaliyah this question, if she can come on in, because sometimes people have a difficult time discerning the difference between their values, their beliefs, where they're going to hang their hat on how they function in life. Because we've been taught so many things that often, you know, if you were raised by someone who was born in the 1940s, you have a different value system versus someone raised by someone that was born in the 60s and the 70s. And then now children you know, of the 80s are having their own kids. What does that look like in terms of this common thread of growth and development and building healthy relationships? Mutual respect, you mentioned, was important. But are there other things that people can put into their toolkit to have balanced, healthy relationships? I think. A big thing is going to be either educating yourself or also being open to other perspectives. And I think that kind of goes with the respect thing. But I think it's going to be being open to know that not everybody's from the same background as you. Not everybody has the same morals as you. But being open to that other people have been able to been, be successful and thrive in this world without doing things the exact same way that you've done. So mm -hmm. being open to the fact that people can do things differently and it can still be effective. So. Part two to that question, what role does judgment, I'm gonna ask Aaliyah first and then I'm gonna go up the line. What role does judgment play in ineffective communication? I would say huge. Um, even us being minorities, a lot of people probably might assume that like, oh, we're not educated or, oh, we're gonna use a lot of slang. Like for even other different races, like Hispanics, people might think that, oh, they don't speak good English. So I think a lot of people, it's very unfortunate nowadays that people will judge you and make assumptions about you before you even open your mouth. Even though the old saying goes, don't judge a book by its cover, most people tend to judge first. Charlotte? I echo everything that she just said. Because, I mean, you know, some things are cultural, some things are ageism, some things are um, gender bias or whatever. And so, I mean, I really don't have anything to add to that. All I can say is amen, sister, because I agree with everything she just said. <laughs> Dr. Whit Bailey. You know, it's been said that it takes seven seconds to make 11 impressions about a person. Mm. And it's unfortunate because again, you bring your culture into the situation. So I live in the Midwest. And so there are certain things that, that just fit in the Midwest. Um, as an African-American woman um, who's 60, uh, it's different. And so we have to make sure that we realize what we are doing and what we are bringing to the table before we judge or have impressions about others, because we're gonna bring that. But how we respond is most important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Let me invite Stacy in on this because she, you just mentioned, Dr. Wibelia, that you're from the Midwest and Stacy is in the, um, just below or above the Mason-Dixon line. And I know that being where she is, culturally speaking, 
there are often issues in that space. What role does judgment play um, for you in being able to help your people communicate effectively? Oh, I'm, I'm just like everybody else has said, judgment is huge. We come into the conversation with already some, most people come into the conversation already with um, their perspective of who you are, um, just by looking at your external um, being or looking at or what they may know about you or, or have heard about you. And sometimes that can block being able to have those communications because you're not going to hear me for who I am or or it may hinder you because you haven't taken time to, to know me beyond your perception of me. So yeah, judgment plays a huge piece in, in communicating with others. Absolutely. When we come back after the break, we're going to talk a little bit about what it looks like to build. What are some of the building blocks that are necessary to having healthy, balanced relationships? We'll be back in a moment. Don't you think it's time to get wealthy? I'm Deborah Owens, America's Wealth Coach, and my new show on the Black Star Network focuses on the things your financial advisor or bank isn't telling you. So watch Get Wealthy on the Black Star Network. Welcome back, everyone. As you can see, judgment plays a part. Who we are plays a part. Where we live, our environment, our experiences all play a part in how we build these relationships. So let's talk about that for a moment. What are some of the tips and tools that we can share with you? Things that we have gleaned. So this is where I'm asking everybody to be open, honest, and transparent. As we talked about in our earlier blocks, because we've all been through some things and we've learned how to not only just remove people from our lives, but how do we keep the people that we hold dear? those relationships that we have truly harnessed the power of what friendship looks like. Welcome in, everybody, because I'm going to do a round robin with this particular block, because we all have friendships that have lasted a long time. Let's start with Dr. Whit Bailey first. What is your longest standing relationship and how do you keep that cultivated? Oh, wow. You would start with me. Um, well, you know, I would have to say, you know, I I would say my longest relationship is with my mother, and that that really is the longest relationship. Um, as some of your viewers know, I, I lost my husband last year. We were married for 30 years, and mm -hmm. and um, so I would have said that would have been the longest, deepest relationship. But my mother has always been there, and uh, we moved my mother here to the town where uh, I currently live in, and she's my road dog. Um, she's the person that is connected to me. Um, I feel most comfortable and confident in talking to her because she knows me. I know her. Um, we trust each other. And so it's not a cop out answer. That is my answer. Um, and then I have childhood friends that, you know, as, as you look at your levels of friendships and the length of time, you have different types of, of relationships with different people. And, and some people you share certain things with, some people you do certain things with. And, but that longest relationship, obviously, is, is with my mother. Mm, absolutely. Aaliyah? I would say my mother, but she just did. I would say my longest relationship is uh, my current best friend. We met our freshman year of college, so it's been about 17 years. Absolutely. How do you keep that relationship alive as you're growing through stages of being a millennial? Um, I know I feel like I sound so redundant when I say this. I think it's communication. It's a lot of communication of what are your needs right now in the friendship? What are you doing? We talk a lot about goals, kind of what of our seasons that like the seasons that we're in, if we're focused on business, if we're focused on like relationships, trying to have fun and how I can be a supportive friend during that season. And also what type of support I would want from you during that season. If it's who I need to call you every day or actually I'm really focused on work. So I might only hear from you once a week. 
you know, I think that it's okay to say communication, 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 because in real estate, we always say location, location, location. And so sometimes the answer is the answer, no matter how many times you say it, it's what you do in it. Because as you just stated, there are different forms of communication, different um, seasons in life. And I, I recently saw a meme that said some people are assigned to you and some people are attached to you. And I think that in each of our growing seasons, we're learning the difference in what that looks like. Charlotte Avery. My longest, my longest relationship that I have, I've had since um, elementary school. And then outside of that relationship, I have other relationships that, um, that I developed in college and just through my 20s. And I will tell you that the one thing that keeps those relationships, you know, thriving is, you know, the intentionality and and just being a person who nurtures relationships. I'm not a person who has to talk to my friends every single day, but I am very intentional about the nurturing of our friendship and our relationship. And and I don't believe in have re having um, relationships that are not reciprocal. Um, that I don't have relationships with people who are takers. We are people, we are, we are sisters who support each other and, and we're there for each other through the good times and the bad times. And, and they're not just riding with me because, you know, everything is, you know, great, grand and wonderful. I mean, these are people who've been with me through the blood, sweat and tears of, of friendship, of marriage, of, you know, birthing children, raising children through sickness and, all kinds of things. And so, you know, it's to me, it's not really the amount of time that I spend with my friends, but the quality of time that we spend together and just us all being intentional about nurturing the relationship for what it needs to be. Mm, that is called the law of reciprocity. Charlotte, I want to ask you a second question before I go to Stacy related to that, because oftentimes kids fall out of love and fall out of friendship because someone didn't text them back right away, didn't respond kindly to a social media post or simply ignored them when they were passing by in the hallway. How do you help our children navigate you know, what you just said, because that does come with some type of maturity to be able to know that, you know, we're friends because we do this or that together, but I'm still your friend, even if we don't do this or that together. Absolutely. We, you know, I teach my children, you know, that we have friends for reasons and seasons. And, you know, just because everything might be going fine and hunky dory in your home and your household, doesn't mean that everything is going on fine, hunky dory in somebody else's household. And so I try to teach my my children about humanity and knowing that just because, you know, somebody seemed like they were, you know, in friendship love with you today, it doesn't mean that they don't love you tomorrow. It just means that they might have some things going on that they may not even want to discuss with you. And so I just teach them how to, you know, be empathetic to others and to, and to also realize who they are because, you know, we also teach people how to treat us. And so, you know, I teach them, you know, you don't have to accept, inappropriate behavior but it is important that you know we respect that you respect your friends that your re your friends respect you and for you to you know really kind of like dig in sometimes and not just cut people off you know to be like oh well you're not talking to me and you're not you unfollowed me on social media or whatever don't just cut people off don't cut your friends off that you said that you valued but to really dig deeper especially if it's a relationship that you value and that they value to say hey you know what what's going on you know have i done something to hurt you or harm you and then if they're like no i just i'm we're just not vibing right now be okay with that even though it may be painful at the time but be okay with that and remember who you are and that there are other special people in the world who really want to love you and have some of your time mm, absolutely stacy talk to us about your standing long relationship um and how you're keeping that together you know, I <laughs> I keep my circle really small, but I do have this one individual who um, she's I would call her my best friend. We've been uh, in each other's lives for a little over 20 years. Uh, yeah, because my son is 30. So we've been in each other's lives since our children were little. Um, I would say what has helped us is we have mastered the art of confrontation. You know, a lot of people look at mm -hmm. confronting or uh, confrontation as being negative, you know, and associated to stress and having to be a disagreement. But if you can learn to put like a positive spin on it and just say that, you know, look at confrontation from a perspective of 
having the strength and the ability to confront an issue, to talk about an issue, to bring an issue to the table, that allows us to keep each other in check. So if she mm -hmm. see me out of the pocket or too far to the left, she does not mind telling me. And same for her. If I see her doing something or going too far to one side, we bring each other back to center. Um, over the years, we have built trust in each other to be able to do that because you don't you don't want to surround yourself with, you know, just yes people or people who just in your circle just to say the things that are comfortable for you to hear. That person that you have associated yourself with for a long time should be able to tell you the good, bad, ugly and different. And you should be able to get up the next day and keep going. Mm -hmm. oh, absolutely. Um, you know, <laughs> some of the things that you all are saying make a lot of sense. And oftentimes we run away from common sense thinking and acting and behavior because we don't know how to deal with those things. When we come back after the break, I want to talk about that for a moment. Now, when I was a Girl Scout, I learned this simple thing, make new friends and keep the old. One is silver and the other is gold. And oftentimes we don't know how to let go when we come back after the break. talk about blackness and what happens in black culture we're about covering these things that matter to us uh, speaking to our issues and concerns this is a genuine people powered movement There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting you get it and you spread the word we wish to plead our own cause to long have others spoken for us we cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Checks and money orders go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037-0196. Cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. Welcome back, everyone, to A Balanced Life. And as you can tell, communication, healthy, open, honest dialogue, being able to confront people, even if they're your friend group, and knowing when to let people be in their space so that they can come into their own season are all very important things in life. But as we talk about these things, there are some things that we are not very comfortable with, and that's allowing people to grow allowing people to move on to their own divine good and find their space in the world and then discovering whether or not we can still be friends as they are maturing. Now I have to say, there are going to be people in our lives that we truly need to release. I mean, like release and let them go like forever. But then there's some people we want to hold on to, but we are not often taught how to do that. And I'm going to ask Aaliyah this first, and she's our licensed professional counselor. What does a healthy relationship look like? But also, when do you know it's turning toxic? Aaliyah. I think, um, again, we've talked a lot about respect and communication. So when those two things seem to be a little off, that's how you can notice that it's becoming toxic. But I'm always, and I advocate to my clients, trust your gut. Whenever your gut is like, this isn't healthy, this isn't right, I don't like the way that I'm being treated. This goes for males and females. Trust your gut. And then whenever that gut feeling comes, have a conversation. And if your concerns aren't even heard or validated, that might be a time for you to reevaluate the relationship and how you choose to continue to interact within it. Absolutely. Dr. Whit Bailey, along those same lines, how do you manage those things in the workplace? Because oftentimes workplace relationships can become toxic and you have to separate yourself from those things but also what level of maturity and personality do we bring to the table in order to navigate those things while we're trying to decide how to land yes i think the most important thing for me is to model it and so if if i'm going around talking about other people or, or sharing things that, that are not appropriate or, or information that shouldn't be shared, then I'm not the good model. So I need to make sure that, that I'm being professional. I need to make sure that I'm bringing positivity into the room or into the space. I need to make sure that I am about the business of the organization. After hours, I need to continue to do that. 
So I can't take that mask and, and put it somewhere else and decide to be overly personal about information that shouldn't be shared. So I have to be that model as the supervisor so that they know that they can't come to me with mess, I'll call it mess. And so because I'm doing it, the hope is that they will do that with their respective staff members. Now, if there's an issue or a problem that comes to the table, then it is important to address it, to say this is information that is confidential, you shouldn't be sharing it. And if it's shared, then we have to come to the table and again and say, this information was shared, it didn't come from me. How, how did it happen? This is not correct. So we have guidelines and in our employee handbook that we follow, but the top thing is to make sure that you are modeling it. So I'm not pretending to be um, a person at work. I'm who I am. And after work, I still need to be that person. Mm, we could do an entire show on chameleon behavior, but I'm going to move on to Stacy with this question <laughs> simply because the second part of the title of her book is a guide to building an emotionally healthy workplace. Talk to us about that in dealing with um, relationships for whatever reason in the workplace that could go awry and how in your book you talk about making the workplace a safe space for people. Yeah, so if I was to build off of what the doctor was just saying, you know, I we coined that as have group norms. So go ahead on and identify how we're going to work together as a team so that we're on the same page in terms of uh, expectations of each other. And that also sets that foundation so that if someone is not, you know, operating within that norm, then we can um, confront them and, and hold each other accountable. Uh, when we master the art of confronting with our uh, employees or our co-workers, that helps us to continue that open and honest communication. It builds that group efficacy. Uh, it tells us that we're working together as a team. But most important when it comes to those emotions, I always tell staff, hey, let's not labor in our emotions. You know, um, when you're in certain professions that require you to be happy, smiling all the time, you know, working in a restaurant, teachers, whatever, you tend to come in and you put on this show or you put on this act and you act like you're one way when within you may have had an event or something that has triggered you to feel a different way. And if you're not going to communicate those inward feelings and let people know what you're really dealing with, then you create this gap between your um, e your emotional reality and your uh, your your emotional labor. You're acting, and in that gap is when you start having frustration, burnout, and it just makes the situation worse. So, no matter which direction you go, all of this is going to always come back to: Can you trust your environment enough? to have the open and honest communication. And just because you communicate it, it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to change a lot in terms of changing others. So now you have to make sure that you are confident in understanding your emotional triggers because it's the only person that's gonna make you happy is you. So that's how you know when you have to let go of certain things, when you're, uh, when you do the things that you need to do, you do the work and it's still causing some internal turmoil with you and you have made your adjustments, then that's how you know if it's time to let go or decide is it time for you to grow or go. Mm -hmm. Grow or go, that's a very, very good way mm -hmm. to say that. Charlotte Avey, what say ye? Well, like, you know, I'm just amening and high-fiving all of our sisters who just spoke. Um, and, and one thing that I do want to say is, you know, you have to know what your capacity is as a, as a person. Um, and, and if you've spent time with somebody who you've called your friend for a period of time, you kind of learn what their capacity is too. But here's the thing, like sometimes our capacities change. And so, you know, as we grow, um, sometimes we know that it's time for us to go when our capacities for certain things start to change. And that's okay because, you know, we have to grow as individuals and they have to grow. And sometimes what I have experienced in some of my lasting relationships is I've had relationships with people who we needed time to go away from each other so that we could grow and then come back and still have healthy, strong relationships. And we were still, we're better for it even now in our, 
you know, in the, you know, where we are in our, in our stage of life and relationship right now. And so I just think, you know, you really have to know what your capacity is. And, you know, the Bible says, you know, a person who wants to have friends shows themselves friendly. So for me, once you start showing yourselves not to be, not to be a friendly person and not to be a loving and kind person, not to be somebody who va who finds value in me, because I already know my value. I know that I'm great and wonderful. That's great. And I don't really need somebody to validate that in me because validation is for parking. So I don't need anybody to park that for me. But what I do need for people to do is to respect me and understand my value. Now, at the point that my value is not significant to you, then it is time for me to go. And that's OK. And I'm all right with that. Mm. So in the last time that we have together, I would like if you would either give a tip or a challenge to the audience as it relates to building healthy relationships. I'll start with Aaliyah. What would you challenge or leave our audience with something to do um, moving forward in building healthy, balanced relationships? I would say communication, but I'm going to switch it up this time because I've been saying communication a lot. I would say prioritize yourself and your needs. Because a lot of the times we want to be there and be such a good friend, such a good employer or family member that we kind of leave our own glass empty because we're so busy trying to fill everybody else. So I would say make sure that you're prioritizing self-care and your needs in every season of life. Absolutely. Stacy. Yeah, I was going to go with that self-awareness. You know, spend some time understanding you, understanding what triggers you, what's your emotional stance on different things, and then understanding how you can, um, you know, I tell people when we talk about the T, uh, knowing your triggers, emotions, and your actions. You do that work so that, not so that you're expecting to change somebody else that you're about to communicate with or about to interact with, but more so that if I see this trigger coming, if I see that you're about to do something that's going to trigger me and I normally get mad or I normally react like this, now that I know my reactions, I see it coming, I can regulate myself and change and do something different so that I can still be able to interact with you. So it, it's all about self work finding out what you need for you. Absolutely. Charlotte Avery. Um, I would also say those same things, but I would also, you know, challenge people, even myself to, to, uh, to be a better listener more than I'm talking. Um, because I think a lot of times when we're dealing with relationships, we are always kind of prepared to be on the defense or the offense. And we don't really listen to people because as they're talking, we're already preparing our, you know, what our rebuttal is going to be. And so for me, I would just challenge people to listen more than you talk so that you can, and, and, and guess what? And not only to other people, but even listen to yourself because, you know, like Stacy was saying, you know, and talking about self-awareness and everything like that, like you've got to also listen to you. It's not just listening to other people and their needs, um, but also listening to the things that, are making you feel a certain way that you can ask yourself the who's, the what's, the when's, the where's, the why, and how this is impacting me. Absolutely, Dr. Whit Bailey. Right on target, right on target. One of the things that, that I like to tell people and to tell myself is to listen to what people are not saying. Mm. Listen to what is not happening. Um, and understand that people go through seasons of life. It's not spring, summer, winter, fall seasons, but certain things may be going on. And so that causes them to say or not say or do or not do. But look at what's happening in between the sentences, in between the lines, so that you know how to respond and give grace when it's necessary, give support when it's necessary, and give space when it's necessary. Mm -hmm. I love all of those things. And I think that they're equally important as we discover how we're going to, you know, continue to move throughout 2023. Some people we're going to keep, some people we're going to let go. And then oftentimes we just need to spend time with ourselves. When we're back after the break, I'll give my reflection. hatred on the streets, a horrific scene, a white nationalist rally that descended into deadly violence. White people are losing their damn minds. It's an angry pro-Trump mob storms the U.S. Capitol. We've seen 
We're about to see the rise of what I call white minority resistance. We have seen white folks in this country who simply cannot tolerate black folks voting. I think what we're seeing is the inevitable result of violent denial. This is part of American history. Every time that people of color have made progress, whether real or symbolic, there has been what Carol Anderson at Emory University calls white rage as a backlash. This is the rise of the Proud Boys and the Boogaloo Boys. America, there's going to be more of this. Here's all the Proud Boys, guys. This country is getting increasingly racist in its behaviors and its attitudes because of the fear of white people. The fear that they're taking our jobs, they're taking our resources, they're taking our women. This is white fear. Welcome back everyone to A Balanced Life and as you can tell there's so many dynamics and components and moving parts to building healthy, strong, lasting, balanced relationships and a lot of it begins and ends with who you are. Discovering who you are as a person, recognizing what you need and keeping that top of mind, being intentional about taking care of yourself and who the people are that you allow in your life. Literally, it's not just how we spend our time, but who we spend our time with. So I'd like to leave you with this. It's important that you discover and become comfortable with spending time with you. You are the best advocate for yourself. You're the most key component to everything that happens in your life. So oftentimes we have to move from that space of just going along to get along and being able to say that I am comfortable not only in my own skin, but I don't have to be a chameleon to please other people. We are the wild card in every situation that we face. And I think that as we move throughout this new year, love you more than you love anything else. Thank you for watching. Bye now.